Welcome, everyone, and uh, aren't we blessed with sunshine today? Um, I, a couple of things. First, please turn off your cell phones. Second is that um, next Friday is the first in the month, believe it or not, and so there will be coffee and goodies here um, at, at about 1.15 before the lecture. The next thing I want to talk about is the fact that at the end of our fall semester, we always have what we call a winter or a holiday luncheon. And that is going to be on the 30th of November. It's the week after Thanksgiving, so maybe you'll be ready to eat something then. <laughs> um, and it's going to start at 1230. And you'll need reservations. There is a charge, um, and next week we will begin signing up people who want to come to the reservation, to the luncheon. It's really a very friendly kind of gathering. And after the luncheon, there will be the lecture at 2 o'clock. So now, now Sandy will introduce the speaker. Hi, and thanks everyone for coming. I want to introduce you, Professor William Mears. Oh, sorry. Um, I want to introduce Professor William Mears from uh, the Department uh, of Art History, correct? In, uh, at UVM. He is the Richard and Adder Green and Gold Professor of Art History at UVM. He's been working there for 30 years, if you can believe anybody works. I guess everybody does try to work that long more or less. Um, he is an art historian in ancient and early medieval art. He teaches classes and uh, courses in Near Eastern, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, and early medieval art, as well as ancient Central Asia. He attended as an undergraduate the University of California at Berkeley and graduate studies at Brown University. And he was a visiting professor in Brazil for a partial semester. He is the author of many books, and he's now editing a book on Central Asia. And today he's here to talk about the Silk Road from early times to the present. So welcome, Professor Mears. So thank you all. Can you, you, can, adjust this? can you hear me? Everyone can hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay. We've all reached that point, I know. I have to constantly tell my students, no, I don't hear from this ear, it's this ear that you need to speak to. So it's a real pleasure to be here again. This is, I think, the fourth time I've spoken before this group, and I enjoy the fact that I'm going to speak a second time on material from Central Asia. The first time I spoke several years ago, it was about the issues of the rediscovery, as it were, of Central Asia and why I thought it had become a popular topic. Uh, and today I'm not going to give you a full history of Central Asia from ancient to modern. I'm actually going to concentrate on the ancient. But um, depending on our time, we'll see whether I can make connections with the modern. So the lights are out. I have shut most of the shades. It is just after lunch. The slides are on. Yes, you may sleep. <laughs> you may snore because it won't bother me, though it may bother the person next to you. What you may not do is you may not open up your phone to watch the Doctor Who episodes you still need to see. <laughs> so, Central Asia has become an interesting topic in the last few years, really the last couple of decades, and I think there are a couple of very specific reasons why. One of them is the Afghan war, which has risen the profile of the region, um, even if not the basic knowledge about it. And the second is the growing concern with China's engagement with it, particularly the Belt and Road Initiative, which has already seen fruition in things like the Karakoram Highway and the beginning to extend the railway linkages. So it is a concern, particularly to the United States, which has been rather late in taking an interest in this region, and I'm not actually sure in the present circumstances we're doing much better, but that's another topic. <laughs> the Central Asian region that I'm concerned about today is the area defined basically by Kazakhstan in the north, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, which form the heartland of Central Asia, the western province of Xinjiang, which is China, China's westernmost province, 
the area of Afghanistan and south into Pakistan. I won't talk about it for my purposes today, but really when one talks about Central Asia, one also needs to include the Southern Caucasus, the regions of Georgia and Armenia, which have long been involved in this region. And one really can't leave out Iran, which has always been a major player in all of this. But if you notice, there is a kind of almost T shape to this. And that reflects the reality of the geography of this region. What you are looking at is an area defined by mountains. So the area over here, the area of modern-day Afghanistan, is the Hindu Kush Mountains. Opposite the Hindu Kush are the western flanks of the uh, Himalayas, which move into the Karakoram. And then north of that are the Pamirs, which define sort of the southern region. Uh, this whole area is the Pamir region. The area of the Kunlun Mountains, which basically are up here, rather, which define the northern edge of the Tibetan Plateau, which is India, Tibet, right in here. And these mountains basically define what is a T form, which then at the top is this group of countries up here. They're also defined by deserts, because if the mountains define one aspect, the deserts define the other. And the deserts are extraordinarily problematic. So you have the Taklamakan Desert, which is about 85% of Xinjiang province and is the driest or second driest place on Earth, depending on what you feel about the Atacama Desert of southern Peru and Chile. We have the Kizilkum and Karakum deserts of, of what is modern-day Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. We have the Mongolian Plateau, which is somewhat desert in the Gobi area, and the desert of the Thar, which is defined by this area where the Indus River comes down. All of this is capped by the great grasslands that form the steppes, which run basically from the Hungarian plain straight across to Mongolia and are interrupted by only two things, the Ural Mountains of Russia basically about here, and the Tian Shan and Altai Mountains of China, which are right about here. Otherwise, this area is a vast grassland, though the grassland varies on what part of the steps you are in. Now, what I want to do is I want to spend my time exploring the dynamics of the ancient Silk Road. But I also need to make very clear to you that the Silk Road doesn't exist. There was no such thing as a Silk Road. That is a 19th century an invention of a German geographer that's convenient and a shorthand way of speaking about trade routes and commerce that moved across basically the Eurasian continent, but which came in many ways to define Central Asia because that's the nodal point from which things either moved in and then moved out. Silk was but one item on that. An important item at certain moments, as I'll show you, but not by any means the most important. And depending on the time, it wasn't even part of the picture in many, at many points. What I want to do is deconstruct a, a group of garments from a burial that I think help to explain and show you the incredible, the incredible number of forces that came to play that define the ancient region. So my burial is from a place called Ying Pan in the very western e or eastern edge of the Taklamakan Desert. Now the Taklamakan Desert is, as I said, one of the driest places on Earth. And because of that dryness, it preserves organic materials. And because of that, we have a tremendous amount of textile material that has been unearthed in the last really the last hundred years, but particularly more recently under very, very good Chinese excavations. The Ying Pan Man, as you see him here, and more or less as he was discovered, uh, was found in about mid-1960s. It has become more and more something we know about as he has begun to tour. He was here in the United States uh, about five years ago. <laughs> the items that define him are this kaftan, which you see here, and these pants, or trousers. The kaftan is wool. It's what we call a compound weave. And it's a rather incredibly complicated compound weave with mirror imagery. So that the imagery on the exterior is gold on a red ground. And when you open it up, it is a red image on the gold ground. But it, they mirror each other exactly. It's the kind of weaving that requires a skilled weaver who understands how not only to work uh, what is, in essence, the horizontal upright loom, 
uh, but also understands how to create mechanical repetitions within that loom. So it is a rather experienced and very sophisticated weaver who made this. The pants are silk. And I'll return to the pants a little later, because it is the kaftan that interests me at the moment. Now, the kaftan is a very specific garment. It is a kind of coat, as you can see in this case. But that coat carries meaning, or certainly did in ancient Central Asia. It is the exact same garment that was worn by the kings of the Kushan Empire, as I show you here on a coin. And it was worn in many ways in opposition to what people within the empire wore, because the Kushan rulers were conquering rulers of the area that stretched basically from Uzbekistan through Afghanistan down into Pakistan and into northern India. All of this was sedentary lands that the Kushans had conquered. And they chose to dress, at least officially, on their coinage and in their statuary with this kaftan. And to understand why they did it, you have to understand what the kaftan meant and why they might have wanted to use it, and by extension, why the Ying Pan man may be dressed in it. So when we look for representations of the earliest kaftans, we find them, interestingly enough, on Greek vase paintings. These are fifth century vase paintings made in Athens. The Athenian who made these, and they're two different painters, one we can identify, the other is not known particularly, but the one on the, uh, on the far side, the right side, is by a very well-known uh, Greek vase painter. Both of these are clearly responding to something they've never seen, but something they've heard about, and are using the dress as a way of referencing the person. And what they're referencing is a Scythian warrior. The Scythians were the nomads with whom the Greeks had the greatest contact. The Scythians existed to the north of the Black Sea, an area the Greeks had colonized. And so Greeks and Scythians regularly interacted, sometimes in a positive and sometimes not so positive way. But the Scythians had become known to the Greeks, and from that source, the vase painters in Athens, who had never ventured into the Black Sea, were able to create an image which any Greek would understand. And in fact, this image traveled to the West because this particular pot was found in Italy and not in Greece. So we know that the image of the warrior, of the nomad warrior dressed in a kaftan, in this case more of a jerkin, but it is the origin of the kaftan, had already become very closely associated with nomads. And clearly it has to do with the fact that you can ride in this costume. It is built for riding. But to fully appreciate the nomad end of this, we need to understand a little about who the nomads were. And for that, we need a little more history. Because nomads don't appear out of nowhere. Nomads are, by nature, people who make their living, at least in Central Asia, by herding. What they herd are sheep, cattle, and goats. Probably about the fourth millennium BCE, there were already people occupying, venturing slightly out into the steppe lands, herding their animals, but always returning back to the river valleys, particularly during the winter months. The reason was simple. The herd animals cannot forage for themselves in the winter. Neither the cattle, nor the sheep, nor the goats can paw through the snow and ice, or they won't. And there they have to be fed. And so one had to move them back to where you had fodder for them. That means you never went very far onto the steppes. At some point, and the archaeological evidence is beginning to show it fairly clearly, at about the fourth millennium BCE, the steppe people began to realize they had another domestic animal, potentially, and that was the horse. The wild horses of the steppes had been around, but they began to tame them. We can find this in the archaeological record of one particular site called Bowtie. Now, we think that they did this in order to have a food source, because horses, unlike the other animals, actually can break through the ice and snow and will feed themselves in the winter. The initial purpose of using them as feed or as a source of food seems to have led at some point, though exactly when we can't say for certain, they began to ride them. Now, the riding did something to change nomad herding, because once you ride, 
you have much more control over a larger area. You are quite far or higher than your herds, which means you can take your herds further out into the steppes. Now, as they moved their herds out into the steppes, they also discovered that the steppes can be exploited if you go in a large enough way around them so that you can move your herds all winter long, or rather all year long, by moving them to different pastures at different times. You still have to put something up against the possibility of no grouse availability in the lower elevations in the winter, but still, properly managed, the steppes will yield a year-round source of food, but you have to expand onto the steppes proper. The horse was the first step. But horses only allowed herders to move up to the steppes. To become really nomadic, you need to bring a family. And that required something else. The culture we think that did this was a culture called the Yamna culture. And the Yamna culture, as you see them here on this map, were neighbors to a culture to the south, which we call the Maikop culture. And these are named for sites that we have no idea what these people called themselves. None of these people wrote. We have no records of them. We identify them by their archaeological remains and by certain kinds of what we call assemblages, which become diagnostic of their existence. The Maikop culture, which is in the modern Caucasus region, emerged probably in the third millennium BCE. And what is important about it for our purposes is the tombs of certain individuals in the Maikop culture contain objects which we can identify the source for. They come from the southern part of Mesopotamia. They come from the region that we identify as the Sumerian culture. They're very specific and very diagnostic, and their presence in this region tells us that the people of the Maikop culture were in some way engaged with the people of Mesopotamia, with the Sumerian culture, which is first urban culture that we possess, at least in the Eurasian well, actually, on the Eurasian continent, to be quite frank. But the question is, what were the people of the Maikop culture supplying to the people of the Sumerian region that would have been worth it to them to send up high-status goods to pay for it? This is a world without coinage. More and more, we think the evidence is that the Maikop people are engaged with the Yamna people, and they've introduced the Yamna people to something. They've introduced the Yamna people to a new breed of sheep. This sheep will emerge as the woolly sheep, long staple wool, quality of wool that could not be obtained in southern Mesopotamia, which is a desert region which works with desert sheep. Mesopotamians seem to have been extraordinarily good weavers. And the first real evidence that we have for long-distance trade of a commodity is the commodity in the trade in finished wool. It comes out of Mesopotamia, is traded into the area of modern-day Turkey. We think, or people are coming to think, I should say, that it's the Maikop people who begin to supply them, at least initially, with a kind of sheep that can only be bred in an area that's cold. And that wool, possibly in finished form, possibly in raw form, is what they're sending south. This is interesting for a couple of reasons, to introduce a theme that is going to remain on this topic for this talk, which is that nothing happens on the Silk Road without interactions. One group influences another. And the second is that hybridization is a standard part of this. Things also change. And commerce is a driving force. But it is probably from Mesopotamia that the last part of this comes in, which is the cart. The cart, once introduced into the steps, becomes the vehicle by which you can move an entire family out. You hook a horse to it, or better yet, by this point, a Bactrian camel, because this is the period when the Bactrian camel, the two-humped camel, is first domesticated, to pull the cart out. And how do you protect the cart and turn it into a moving home? That long stapled wool. That long wool felt beautifully. And any of you that have ever felt it know different wools felt differently. This felt to create thick pads of felt that when draped over a cart give it the effect of an RV. <laughs> and that's how these people moved out. How do we know? Partially we find the evidence of the carts, and partially we're beginning to see the movement 
right onto the steps, which means the families are coming. We now have, probably by the middle of the third millennium BC, a completely nomadic society, which is moving, dependent on herds, herding horses, herding cattle, herding this long staple wool, sheep, woolly sheep, and goats, and beginning to exploit it fully. That's an interesting story, but it gets even more interesting. Sometime around 2000, the dates vary, but we'll say 2000, one of these cultures on the edge of the steppes, a sedentary group but clearly engaged with the steppe peoples, does something to the cart. We know this because we find it in their burials. They turn the cart into a chariot. The chariot is a steppe invention. This, and with it the domesticated horse, spreads and it spreads rapidly. If the 2000 date is good, then the chariot is into the ancient Near East by about 1800 BC. It is into China certainly by about 1200 BC. It spreads south into India, and it spreads, we think, in a certain way. Those Maikop people, right here, we think they're related to all of us. They, we think, are the Proto-Europeans. They are the people that speak the mother language from which most of modern European languages, the Iranian languages, the Indian, North Indian languages, and yes, three of the languages of the far western part of the Taklamakan all descend. But they begin to move. They migrate in all directions, and with them comes the chariot. And the reason we know that is because the chariot is referenced in the literary works that we assign to this period. So when you read the earliest Indian literature we possess, that we think reflects the moment of the invasion of the Indo-Europeans. They come with chariots. When Homer speaks of the world of Greece, and it is the world of the Indo-Europeans he is speaking of, the chariot is there. The chariot becomes one of the features that now dominates the Eurasian continent, and it is basically a product of Central Asia, a product of the steppe lands that moves out. But that doesn't explain the costume. That doesn't explain anything about a kaftan, because you certainly don't need a kaftan to ride a chariot. So something else is at work here. Something happens in Central Asia. Mm, the date is not firm. 900 BCE, maybe 1,000 tombs. Tombs up in the Altai Mountains, those mountains that block the movement of the grasslands basically separating Mongolia from Kazakhstan. Some tombs, impressive tombs, large mounded tombs that we call kurgans. Inside them, some incredibly rich findings, and with them, the evidence for riding. We know this. We know that when the chariot comes in, it comes in with the domesticated horse, but we also know that riding is not acceptable. So the chariot carries both the use of warfare in basically the ancient Near East and in China, but riding is not acceptable. We have at least one document that clearly indicates that a king who rode on a horse was engaged in an activity that was unacceptable. So riding is not an acceptable option when the chariot is there. The chariot is the status symbol and also the platform for warfare. Something has to change that, and that change occurs in the nomad lands when the nomads decide to switch from using carts and chariots as their vehicle of mobility to actually using the horse, primarily for mobility, not for herding, though they continue to use the horse for herding, and to do something. One last thing they need. They need another invention, and the invention is a new type of bow. It's what we call the composite recurve bow. Composite because it's made of more than one material, 
and it curves in on itself so that its power to thrust is much stronger. They, the nomadic people of the far eastern region, learn how to use that bow. They learn how to use it and ride simultaneously. And with that, they move to the west, where they become the Scythians of the Greek region and the Sakas of the Persian region. And they wreak havoc over the sedentary peoples to the south. How do we know they begin to identify themselves? By their riding. And oh yes, by the costume that goes with riding. Because a Greek artist was commissioned by one of these high-ranking elite members of this society to make this gold comb for his funerary purposes. And what you can see is a Scythian warrior dressed in a jacket with trousers, what is the prototype for that kaftan, engaged with another warrior, also a Scythian warrior, and we happen to think this is a narrative, engaged in warfare based on the horse. So, why does it matter? It matters because this garb becomes synonymous with power and with force and with the ability to put others at bay. And the nomad story, which continues all the way to the Mongol period, is a story of constantly moving into the sedentary cultures of the South and disrupting them. There's a message in the choice of a kaftan. But what about the silk trousers? The trousers, yes, reference part of the garb of a mounted nomadic warrior. But the silk is intriguing. So it's one of those moments when the nomads have disrupted the order of the sedentary south. Here's China, Han China, the first great empire, roughly a 600-year reign. To their north, a nomad group, the Xiongnu, a highly hierarchical structure, powerful force, demanding of China or at least from her borderlands, constant tribute, constant artifacts going north, including princesses. The Xiongnu move to the west and disrupt another group. The Xiongnu, we're not sure. Maybe Mongolian, maybe not. But the people they disrupt, we know. The Yuichi, they're Iranian. They're pushed over here, right about into there. The Chinese emperor Wu Di has an idea. Why not form an alliance with the Yuichi? The Yuichi have been pushed out by the Xiongnu, an alliance with the Han Chinese, and together they'll fight the Xiongnu and push them back, securing the border to the north. Good idea, but the Yuichi aren't interested. But his ambassador finds something right in there, a valley, still a contested valley to this day, called the Fergana Valley. And what does he find? Horses. Horses that sweat blood. Possible reasons why that are not important to us. But they identify a very, very rapid horse, a horse that the Chinese have never seen before, a horse that they can use, very much use against the Xiongnu, but it requires a change. It requires the move from being chariot-based to cavalry-based. And the cavalry is now on the forefront. We first saw these horses, you may have seen it, the great 1970 exhibition of Chinese archaeological artifacts, the first time that we had seen things coming out of China since the 1920s. And all of us were stunned when we saw the great horse, the Gansu horse, who stands on top of a bird. He is what the Chinese call the flying horse. Once introduced, these horses change everything. 
The chariot ceases to be an article of war, and it is the cavalry that now takes over. And you can see it even in a Han Chinese wall painting, where it is the cavalry or the mounted warriors who surround the chariot, which is used merely as a status symbol. The power of this change gives the Chinese the ability to push the Xiongnu back, but it also changes the economy of Central Asia. Because while the Emperor Wu Di initially uses force to get the horses, he soon finds there's a much better thing he can buy them with. Silk. So to understand the power of silk and why it was what it was, you have to understand what the Chinese did to it. So lots of places can produce silk. Silk was even produced in the Mediterranean because lots of caterpillars weave silk cocoons. There's nothing unusual about it. There were several places where you could find silk, and it was used to make cloth. What the Chinese did was to control its production. And they began, certainly by the Han, if not earlier, to control this by demanding silk of a certain quality to be made in order to pay taxes. So the entire country was engaged in producing silk. Now to make Chinese silk, you must first isolate the caterpillar. So you do that by basically collecting the eggs or forcing the moths to lay eggs in one particular spot basically in a basket, so you have them. And you keep all your eggs from one moth, the, Bombi Mora, or the Bombi, Bombex mori moth. Then you feed the caterpillars on one specific thing, carefully selected white mulberry leaves, where there is no tannin. You may not give a leaf that is blemished. You then feed and let the caterpillars rest, and you keep them very, very sedated. And they munch away and grow quite rapidly, and then they weave a silk cocoon. Now what makes any animal that weaves a cocoon, and it's true of spiders that use silk to weave their webs, is they weave it as a continuous strand. So when this, or when this caterpillar weaves a cocoon, it is a continuous strand of silk filament that runs for about a kilometer. So the trick is you don't let the moth emerge. You stop the moth, except for the ones you're going to use, as it were, for breeding purposes. You kill the caterpillar. You boil it, which is what you see happening up here. You boil it, and then you unravel that single filament that runs for a kilometer with no brick. Then you ply filaments together, because the filament is far too fine to use. Minimum of three, up to as many as 12 filaments to form a thread. And what you have is a continuous, unblemished white thread of pure silk. Now, the thing about silk that differentiates it from any of the other fibers available, flax, from which you get linen, cotton, even wool, though it shares with wool this feature, it's a protein fiber. And when you dye a protein fiber, the dye adheres to it. Unlike cotton, where, the where you'll lose a lot of the dye in washing, the dye applied to silk and to wool adheres. There's a particular reason why this is the case. That means you can get luscious, deep color on, on both wool and on silk. But you can do something to silk. You can flatten the fibers by polishing it. And then silk does something that no other fiber does. Maybe my shirt will do it for you, because I've worn my Chinese silk shirt. You see, how it, you see how it reflects the light? It bounces light back. It doesn't absorb it. The unpolished portion of this shirt is absorbing, which is why you're noticing it comes in flecks on the shirt. Unpolished silk will absorb the same way wool will. But polished, polished silk bounces light back. And you can weave a variety of different kinds of textures, depending on what gauge of thread you use. Wool has no chance to compete. Cotton, no chance. And certainly linen is useless. Silk has a vibrancy. You can still see it. 
This is over 2,000 years old, and it still has that power to direct light. The silk can be used both to weave and, as the top example shows, to embroider. So what Wu Di did, and what successive emperors following him did, was they flooded Central Asia with silk. That silk had to go places. To be valuable, it had to be used. It could be used, certainly, within the context of garments within the region, but its real value lay in developing markets for it elsewhere. One of those markets was to be the Roman Empire. The Romans, we are told, first experienced silk and its power to reflect light in a very famous battle. The general Crassus, foolishly, stupidly, decided to fight the Parthians. He engaged in a war he started. Sounds suspiciously similar, but that's a different story. <laughs> And when he went to fight them, his legions, the pride of the Roman Empire, were blinded by the banners that were unfurled by the Parthians. The Parthians were buyers of Chinese silk, and their banners seemed to have reflected the light back to in a way the Romans had never seen. It's a good excuse for losing a battle, but still, <laughs> it tells you something about the m power of this new material. The Chinese had long used silk banners in warfare, and that's what you see here from a Han tomb. But clearly, the Parthians had decided to borrow this idea. Silk became one of the forces. But there was something else that would move silk. So in India, in the fifth 6th century BCE, a new religion had emerged. The religion is Buddhism, and it was one of many competing faiths that took shape during that particular moment in Indian history, and there are lots of social reasons why it began to take shape. It was one, as I say, of many and rather minor, probably until the 3rd century BCE when the Emperor Ashoka the first great unifier of much of India, took an interest in the faith, perhaps converted. It isn't quite clear to us, but whatever he did, he promoted the faith. And by promoting it, he spread it widely, and he spread it with imperial patronage. It would not have been particularly important to our story, I suspect, if the Kushans, who later took over portions of Ashoka's earlier empire and then spread or connected that portion of India north all the way up into what is modern-day Uzbekistan, if those rulers had not also decided to patronize Buddhism, again, not necessarily becoming Buddhist, but deciding that there were uh, political reasons to patronize it. Buddhism certainly spreads north from India into the region of modern-day Afghanistan. You can still find there are magnificent Buddhist remains in Afghanistan and Pakistan and north all the way up into, as I say, the region of modern Uzbekistan. Now, as Buddhism moves, it takes with it the concept of the stupa. The stupa is the monument that marks, it marks technically a burial spot and marks, in theory, the burial spot of the remains of the Buddha himself. But as this faith moves north, it sometimes also marks the burial or spot of something important associated either with the Buddha himself or with one of the other saintly figures that emerge as a feature of Buddhism. In simple terms, the Buddhist stupa becomes a part of the sacred landscape that exists from northern India all the way up into Uzbekistan. And the stupa is part of something larger. It is part of a monastery because the Buddhist faith moves through monasteries. Buddhist monks, missionaries, establish themselves, build monasteries around the centers for stupas. But there is within Buddhism the concept of the appropriate, the appropriate items to associate with the remains of the Buddha, what we would call in the West relics of the Buddha. And one of those will be silk to wrap the items within a reliquary with Chinese silk, this finest of all silks, to drape the stupa itself in silk. 
What Buddhism does is to take a fabric and work it in to a religious hierarchy of objects and to make it a central feature, something necessary for the existence of the architecture that frames it. The move of Buddhism is in its own right an interesting one. But of course the question becomes who moves it? Yes, patronized by the Kushan emperors beginning first century BCE and continuing perhaps through roughly the third century, early third century CE, yes, they patronize it and some of the monasteries are clearly the work of imperial patronage, but not the bulk. No, there's something else that's moving Buddhism. So there are two types of Buddhism for our purposes. There are more than that, but two. There is the very, very old traditional Buddhism, which we call Theravada Buddhism, practiced today in Sri Lanka and in Thailand primarily, and in East Southeastern Asia. And then there's a different kind of Buddhism. I mean, they're all related, but nonetheless a different one that has emerged slightly later called Mahayana Buddhism. Both types move north. But Mahayana Buddhism has a very special quality to it. It is a particularly good kind of religion for merchants. <laughs> it is the religion in which you can earn merit by giving gifts to a monastery. It sounds suspiciously like a Catholicism of the Middle Ages. <laughs> That is what happens. The great benefactors of many of these monasteries are merchants. And I was reminded this morning as I left of something which is so minor and yet so telling. I was freezing as I came out to warm up my car. And then I reminded myself, oh yes, all of these people did most of their traveling in the winter. Yes. They would rather cross the mountains in the winter because bad as snow might be, it's better than raging torrents of water that come out of those glacial rivers in the spring and summer. The deserts may not be happy places in the middle of winter, but they're a lot better than they are in the summer. Most of these people did travel during the cold winter seasons. This was difficult, demanding, and scary work. And I tell my students, you never know where you're going to be inspired by something. So I went to a movie. I went busily fitting you into the International Film Festival. That's how important this talk was to me. I'm giving up a film. <laughs> so I went to a film the other night called Makala, which is all about charcoal making in Africa. Did anyone see it? Oh, good. A couple of you. It is a heartbreaking story of what it is to make your living basically burning down the forest in order to produce the charcoal that most people need. And as this poor fellow loads up his bike with what looks like about 300 pounds of charcoal in bags, he sets off to the big city, 50 kilometers away. He's a single individual. And though the image of Silk Road trade is always big caravans, the documentation suggests that's not the way merchants moved. In many cases, they moved in very small bands and may often have moved alone, so that they were quite at risk when they did this. So my fellow with his bike of charcoal finally hits the main road, paved, except that on the main road are all of the towns. And every time he goes through the towns, he's extorted for the privilege of coming through the town. A bag of charcoal here, a bag of charcoal there to pay for the privilege. That must have been exactly what it was like to be a merchant on the Silk Road. If the bandits didn't get you, if the mountains didn't kill you, the deserts didn't burn you, the towns would take what you had if they could. So yes, a religion that promises you some protection above all, the great figure of that religion, the great Guan Yin figure, Avalokiteshvara, the great Bodhisattva of compassion, to whom you can call 
in moments of need. Yes, that's a religion you patronize. And here they are. Here are the Central Asian patrons of the great Buddhist cave monastery at Kizil, in the northern route of the Taklamakan. And notice what they're wearing, kaftans. But there's something else. Central Asians just didn't rely on China for their silk. They stole the knowledge. Oh yes, the Chinese sent their princesses to marry the local princes. And one wrote to his future bride, if you want silk garments, you better bring the raw material. And so she did, so we are told. She loaded her crown or her headdress with silk cocoons, and brought them to her tan, where silk was being manufactured probably from as early as the first century CE. Silk in Central Asia becomes a major product of many of the oasis towns of the Taklamakan region. And that silk becomes so good, and the patterns that the Central Asians put onto that silk that it is transshipped back to China, where it becomes an item of exotic use. You've heard about this, no? It's called the theft of intellectual property. <laughs> it's very old and very well established. So silk comes down the Buddhist path and ends up back in India. India has silk. India's silk is what we call tassa silk, raw silk, coming out of basically collected cocoons that are collected in the forest after the moths have emerged. It's a beautiful silk. If you like silk and you like tussa silk, you know what I'm talking about. It's nubby, it has texture, but it dies terribly unevenly, and it has no sheen because it's almost impossible to shine. It is a kind of silk that the Indians used, but when the elite Indians began to look at Chinese silk, they quickly moved to that. So that there is Chinese silk on the Indian market that has nothing to do with Buddhism. And eventually that silk makes it to the western ports of India, the ports that line this region right in here, particularly this one at Barbaricum. That is where Roman traders end up. Out of Alexandria, coming down the Black, uh, coming down the Black Sea, coming down the Red Sea into the Indian Ocean and straight over here, and then up to here. They're here for pepper, primarily pepper and gemstones. <coughs> but when they discover the silk, it comes right back with them. So the silk in the Roman world is coming in over land and by sea, ending up largely in the markets of the Eastern Mediterranean, then being transshipped into Rome itself. What do the Romans offer in place? Gold coinage, yes. The Indians want gold, and Rome pays a lot of gold to get all sorts of good objects. But they also have a commodity that is particularly valuable, not to them, but to the Eastern world. Blown translucent glass. Neither China nor India nor anywhere in Central Asia can yet produce it. They don't have the technology, and it takes over. It's the same with the beads with which the Dutch bought Manhattan. Something of no value in one place has great value in another. Here, we find not only glass vessels, but in this case, a painted vessel, produced, we think, in Alexandria, one of three, which seem to have been valued enough that they were kept in a kind of treasury, and which are decorated with imagery that is pure Mediterranean classical imagery. So let's consider what's decorating that kaftan. So my picture is bad, and I apologize for this. It shows you this as the main pattern, and that really is a facing goat separated by pomegranate trees. No, this is the pattern that I'm interested in, which is up here and repeated down here. These are little Cupid figures, what we call Arabs, Eroti, battling one another. It's a wonderful late classical 
form, something you would have seen, well, if you've traveled at all in Greek cities in Asia Minor, it's the kind of thing that you would find decorating the temple at Didyma if you went there. Something that decorates, that's a decorative band in different places and was particularly popular in the Roman world. Well, we're not in the Roman world. In fact, we're not even close to the Roman world in date. And not only is this motif a classical motif, it's been extraordinarily well executed. This weaver, I told you, was quite skilled. This is a weaver who can make a compound weave with mirror imagery. So that, to begin with, tells me I'm dealing with a highly skilled technical weaver. But this is a weaver who knows a pattern that has no place in the world in which he or she works. And not only knows how to do it, but knows how to execute it with flawless precision, because this is beautifully done. And though you have to take my word for it, trying to turn a curve in this manner and create a form that works in space like this is not easy for any weaver to do. So the question is, why and under what circumstances was this made? So there is a Greek source. Alexander the Great did indeed conquer Central Asia. He conquered all the way to the edge of India. He did take the territory over. And upon his death, this region, Central Asia and its northern part, and in fact that entire corridor space down to the northern part of India, eventually became part of a Greek kingdom, the Seleucid Kingdom. About the middle of the third century BCE, the northern portion of that region, a place called Bactria, separated itself became its own independent Greek kingdom with rulers, we know the names of them, and as whole succession, dynasties. They built cities of which one has been found. Alas, it is now, as far as anyone knows, in complete ruins. It is not in a part of Afghanistan that anyone goes to now for archaeological purposes. But thankfully, when the French dug it, they dug it well and published it well, so we can still use it. It is the site of Ay Khanum. And though there is much about this site that is not to the eyes of many of us really Greek, there's enough of it that we know that the underlying structure is responding to Greek forms. Not only does the city in terms of its origins and sort of spatial arrangements reflect Greek forms, but the coinage that the kings of this empire struck is among the finest Greek style coinage we possess. They are always, if you're a coin collector, this is what you want. It'll cost you a mint, but it's worth it. And decorating the city, at least there are a few pieces, no, again, my slide is not good, a few pieces of very clearly Greek style, Hellenic style sculpture that decorated, at least in this case, one of the grave monuments. So yes, within this world there was a Greek presence, and that Greek presence took the form of a material culture, leaving behind a legacy. Sure, sure, that explains it. Well, yes and no. Remember the Yuichi? The Yuichi, ooh, the traveled because they were pushed out by the Xiongnu. Guess what they did? They destroyed that empire. And they had nothing to do with it. And from them came their descendants, because the Kushans are one of the tribes of the Yuichi. The Kushans had absolutely nothing to do whatsoever with Greek culture, other than perhaps a memory of destroying it and a memory of their nomadic heritage, because that's what the costume that the king, and this is Kanishka, is referring to. But they were promoters of Buddhism. And it was within the territory of their empire, a place called Gandhara, that Buddhism first created the image of the Buddha. Buddhism had existed for roughly 600 years without the image of the Buddha. The earliest forms of Buddhism are what we call aniconographic, meaning there is no image of the Buddha. There are images of other things, but not of the Buddha. The Buddha is referenced through his footprints, through the wheel of the Dharma, and a few other objects, but never the Buddha himself. No, the Buddha will be developed in Gandhara. And here the sculptors begin to explore the form of the Buddha, and you see him here, by creating the human shape, and by trying to understand the anatomy of that form as it is revealed under drapery. It is very much a classical Greek response to the form. That is what first attracted British from India into Gandhara. These were discovered and it was proof positive the Greeks had left their mark. 
The trouble is about 400 years of no Greek activity. But there is that new Roman Mediterranean force that comes in. That force perhaps is quite strong, as I showed you with the glass. So two possible sources which lie behind the image. One, the old residual Greek presence. And two, a new catalyst in the form of classical forms coming in via Roman traders into these ports in the southern part of the Kushan region, coming in through the northern west, northwestern ports of India. A possible third, but not one I want to go into. Does it matter? It matters, yes, because it's about the bleed through of older cultures. Central Asia is a layered world. One culture atop another. One culture conquering but not displacing what is below it. It's hard to find that, as I tell my students here in the United States. You can. It's the American Southwest. The indigenous culture, the Spanish, the Mexican, and the Anglo. And in the right places you can see them all. Acama Pueblo. But it's hard. It's hard to realize what it is to layer one culture atop another and then watch those on the bottom force themselves back up. But they will. Any of you that spend time in the Southwest know the indigenous forces are coming back. If you've witnessed the battles over whether or not you can erect a statue to Coronado and not have problems, yes. These cultural elements are there. So whether the Buddha is residual Greek, newly formed Roman, or some combination of both doesn't really concern me at this moment. But what does concern me is that that style, the Gandharan style, moves out of Gandhara and moves to the north and moves directly into China. So, we now have to consider yet another player in this in a new way. Buddhism first appears in China probably under the Han Dynasty, the same time as they're beginning to flood that market with silk. Buddhism is inching its way in, but the Han, the Han Dynasty is not interested in Buddhism, so it is just one of the religions and not a terribly important one. When the Han Dynasty collapses, third, early third century CE, it is replaced by a period of chaos, a period during which the country basically splits into the northern and the southern regions, and both regions have a variety of competing forces for governing. In the north, the forces that take over uh, are friends, nomads. In this case, the Tuba nomads, who now take over and establish themselves as the Wei dynasty. And all of these nomads abandon nomadic lifestyle but become very much the force that governs and a memory of their nomadic past. The way find Buddhism useful. They probably believe in it, but they certainly see a political advantage to supporting it. And up comes Buddhism. In a variety of monasteries, many of them cave monasteries, often funded by imperial wealth, but also, once again, funded by a variety of other forces. The most famous are these great caves at Dunhuang, the Mogao Caves, where this very early cave possesses one of these Gandharan-influenced images, though I'm not going to spend time telling you how that works. So for all of this, is a Ying Pan Man a Buddhist? And does it really matter? Well, by this time you've got the rhetoric of this lecture. Yes, it matters. <laughs> So here is how he's laid out. He is laid out in an inhumation burial. His head rests on a pillow in the shape of a rooster. I looked low, high and low and no one has a picture of that rooster. Take my word for it. It is a rooster. It's a silk pillow, Chinese silk embroidered. His face is covered with a hemp mask and the mask is clearly made to fit his face. No, no, this is not a Buddhist burial. This is most assuredly not. 
He's not Buddhist. What is he? The hemp mask is probably what we call a padan mask. Now, a padan mask has a very specific purpose. It is to prevent the individual who wears it from polluting a sacred fire. It belongs in a very specific context. It belongs in the context of Zoroastrianism. Now, Zoroastrianism is the religion of the sedentary peoples of Iranian origin. It is, by this point, the dominant religion in Persia. We are in the world of what we call the Sasanian Persians. And during this period of time, the Persians have a very orthodox form of Zoroastrianism, which is quite clearly controlled with a clergy of great power. Inhumation burial is not an option with an orthodox Zoroastrianism as practiced within the Persian faith. So he's likely not a Persian. His garment would be OK, though. His great kaftan would suit a Persian. Not really, though. The Persians don't tend to hold on to their nomadic origin, at least not in what they wear. But the decorative elements of it, that classical reference, is something Persians were still using as decorative motifs, with no meaning attached to them. But he's not Persian. Fire worship was practiced by a number of other forms of Zoroastrianism, and you can see it here. Here's the fire altar, and here are the figures here, and they protect their face so that they don't pollute the fire. You don't pollute the fire, and when you die, you do not allow your remains to pollute the earth or the air. To do that, you are defleshed. So the normal way that a Zoroastrian, whether in Persia or in the regions around Iran that practiced Zoroastrianism would do this, is they would place the body on a platform and let the birds deflesh the body so that there is no pollution of the ground, no pollution of the water, and no pollution of the fire. No cremation allowed. But he's laid out in inhumation form. His bones were not collected and placed within an ossuary, which is where the bones would be placed if it were a normal defleshing arrangement. No. No, he cannot be, well, maybe. So there was a group, a group of Persian, no, a group of Iranians, a group of Iranian language speakers that we know as Sogdians who lived, oh, where did they live? They lived exactly over the Bactrian world. They were the inheritors of that Greek kingdom of Bactria. After the Yuichi had become the Kushans and the Kushans had fallen, suddenly the Sogdians emerged. A group of federated merchant cities with ties that have communities all the way over in China and possibly over the, all the way over in the Byzantine West. There was the Sogdians who worked out treaties with the Byzantine Empire for trade purposes. The Sogdians in China form restricted communities. The Chinese allow them to live. And after all, this is the Tang <coughs> Dynasty, the great moment in China's history when her openness to the West is at its greatest. So yes, she allows the Sogdians in. She refuses to allow them too much engagement with the local population, but even that she doesn't really control because the great rebellion against the Tang is led by a general of Sogdian origin in service to the Tang Emperor. So even there, they don't quite hold control over it. But in theory, the Sogdian merchant colonies must live together, must be governed by a local official called a Sogbao, but are allowed to practice the religion of Zoroastrianism and are allowed to bury their dead as Zoroastrians, but with a caveat. Chinese sensibilities will not allow for a body to be defleshed. Therefore, the Sogdians resident in China create a new way of burying their dead. Unlike within the areas where Zoroastrianism is dominant, they lay their dead out on great couches, raised up so that they don't touch the earth, removed enough so that when sealed they don't pollute the air. And here, they commission stone couches with carvings that often reflect an idealized view of the Sogdian world that they have left behind. I think 
the Ying Pan man is just such an individual. But not quite, at least not as he expected to be. So there's something very interesting about that kaftan. If it were a Central Asian kaftan, it would close to the left. It closes to the right. That's the Chinese way of closing ropes. He is wearing a modified kaftan in Chinese style. I think he comes from one of these communities. I think he was on a trade mission. He was quite well off. He had a magnificent garment, which he clearly carried with him for some purpose. And that purpose, I assume, was to wear when he got back. He was young. He is Caucasoid. That much we can identify. And he died en route. There was no resident Sogdian community in the town he died in. Otherwise, they would have done something like this for him. But he was laid out and treated with great respect as much as the local community was capable of doing for someone. And at least someone knew that the mask should be placed over his face. Treated with the greatest of care. His garments tell a long series of stories about the ways in which this world of trade interacts and the forces moving it around. So my paper did say, and I'm a little bit over, but I'll keep you for a couple of more minutes as I tell my students. Because I did promise you some thoughts on the modern world. So I am not, obviously, an historian of the modern world. But I do find some relationships incredibly intriguing. So when you think about Central Asia right now, and you think about how it's lined up, you realize it looks suspiciously like it did during the two periods I've spoken of, during the Han Dynasty and the Roman Empire, and the Tang Dynasty and the Byzantine Empire. Because during that period of time, neither China nor the West controlled it. They were involved with it. They influenced it. They clearly benefited from it. But they couldn't control it. That changes. The Mongol Empire is completely controlled. But during these periods, it was not. And that's quite similar to the situation today. The west of the European Union does not extend control into Central Asia. And China does not extend control beyond the borders of Xinjiang province. Now, while it's true that Central Asians, and I know this from conversations I had this summer, are worried about China, they're also very anxious to become engaged with this Belt Road Initiative. And there's something else quite interesting about this moment. And that is there are two auxiliary forces pushing into the region. One of them is a very traditional force of India. India's always been involved. India's heavily involved in Afghanistan, if you're not yet aware of that, through a variety of initiatives. And Indians' interest in this, and particularly interest in the Himalayas, in Nepal, is palpable. The Nepalese are very worried about India, far more than they are about China. This is not unlike the situation during which the Tang and the Byzantine, and even India at that point, but very much like the Han, the Roman, and the Kushan period, there is another force that's pushing down, and that's Russia. The forces from the north have traditionally been the steppe lands. The steppe lands aren't doing it right now, but Russia is in many ways exerting her influence. So no, not exactly the ancient world, but not totally unlike it. There's something else that I think is intriguing. In many ways, what I would argue is taking the place of Buddhism. And that's tourism. And if any, if any of you that travel into the developing world and use tours, and I do at this point, I, I confess, I don't travel on my own anymore. Um, tours are very intriguing, besides the dynamics of the people you travel with. But when you talk to your guides, you learn a lot. So tourism is bifurcated. There is adventure tourism, 
which is one whole group of guides, and there's cultural tourism, a whole group of other guides. And what they know is entirely different. The culture tourist people are extraordinarily knowledgeable about where they're going, where they're taking you, and what it is you should see. And they can answer a tremendous amount if you quiz them. And the adventure guides know very little about the culture, but they know everything about how to move through this territory. These were, of course, the great merchant routes. Because when you do adventure tourism and you go hike in the Pamirs, you are hiking along the very routes that were used to enter China from the south. They are the same routes that have been used for eons. And when you do the cultural tourism, you are stepping on the same places that once moved Buddhism, and for that matter, Nestorian Christianity or Manichaeanism around this region. And there's something else about tourism. The Sogdians were not only great merchants, they were great linguists. See, the Chinese were not. Chinese were like we are. They were monolingual, and they saw no reason why they should learn languages. And they didn't. But they were entranced with Buddhism. Buddhism is an Indian religion. And the Buddhist script comes up in either the Indian Prakrit languages, of which Gandhari is one, or in Sanskrit. Those are Indo-European languages, and Chinese is not. Who translated the Buddhist documents, the texts, the first translations from Indian languages into Chinese? Sogdians. And the Sogdians weren't even Buddhist. language. If you want to succeed today in Central Asia, you know three languages. Your mother tongue, if you're smart Russian, and English. You don't go anywhere without them. Oh yes, and language is even more complicated than that. This bleed through, this bleed through of older cultures into new places. So Stalin drew the lines of modern Central Asia. He did it evidently when he was drunk, so the story goes. I doubt it. It was intentionally designed so that all of the Central Asian countries do not contain one ethnicity. So when you visit Uzbekistan, you were taken to Samarkand and to Bukhara the great centers of medieval Central Asia. They're Persian cities. Uzbek is Turkic. The Uzbeks are speakers of a Turkic language because they are later arrivals. But in Bukhara and in Samarkand, Persian is still spoken among the Tajiks, who are now an ethnic minority. But when you go to Tajikistan and they talk about who they are, they incorporate Bukhara and Samarkand into their identity. Languages play a hefty role in this. And which languages you speak matter. I have a friend whose son is married to a Tajik woman. This woman comes from a very elite Tajik family, elite during the Russian period. She never learned Tajik. She speaks Russian and English. And what is she studying now? She's studying Persian. She's studying Farsi, not Tajik. Why? Because there are status associations with the native language. Bleed through comes in other ways as well. At this moment, if you're ethnic Russian, you have to debate whether you will stay in these countries. Because there's real questions about the role of ethnic Russians. Should they remain or should they not? And what role do they play? And which language do they speak? These are ancient issues that are still very much alive. Let me leave you with the last one, that one I introduced you to. 
which is the concept of intellectual property theft. There was an article, maybe some of you saw it a while back in the New York Times, in which someone tried to explain that this idea makes very little sense in Asia, particularly within the Chinese orbit, where the whole idea of copying, imitating, and improving is a deep-seated cultural force. How do you learn to paint in China? How do you learn? You copy old masters. Why do we have an idea of what was painted in certain dynasties where we don't have a single thing remaining? Because we have the copies of works that were made, because that's how you learn. No one thought it was wrong, and no one does to this date. Now, I'm not here to defend the policies. What I'm merely pointing out is the idea that you take what is given to you and you change it, modify it, and make it work in a new setting that we call interfering with cultural property is not necessarily a universally held idea and certainly wasn't in antiquity. And you change things. Why do I think that kaftan is decorated the way it is? Because that still has decorative currency. Sogdians inherited all of those forms and they merely reused them for new purposes. There's a dynamism to it. And it's very hard to control that dynamism. <coughs> and the last thing, what I've already mentioned to some extent, ethnic identity, that kaftan, and what it means and how you understand it. You see, costumes still play a role in Central Asia. What you wear identifies who you are. Sometimes it's state-imposed. In Turkmen, you must dress this way in Turkmenistan. Sometimes it's by choice. The hat of the Karakol, which tells me immediately that I'm looking for someone up from the Khorasmian region of Uzbekistan. The dress of an Uzbek woman with her particular treatment of the, um, of the ikat dye. The dress and you do recognize the kaftan, of the Uyghur of modern-day Xinjiang province, those people that are being persecuted, who identify themselves in origin as a nomad people. So I hope I've kept you. I apologize. I hope I've given you some things to think about, perhaps introduced you to some things you didn't know about Central Asia. And I'll be happy to try and answer questions. Thank you very much. No questions? Nope. Nope, there's one over there, it looks like. Can you, can you ask it loudly enough that I can hear you? No. It was the Songdians that you said were linguists, right? Mm -hmm. And what was their time period? Songdians appear, they begin to appear about the first century BCE, but their high point is the sixth and seventh centuries CE. So the period just before the arrival of the Arab conquerors. So there was written language at that time? Oh, all of these regions beginning really from the, from about the third century BC on have writing. Okay, that was what I was yeah. wondering, thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Way back, we have one way back there. You mentioned that the Chinese language was uh, monolingual. No, I mentioned that the Chinese were monolingual rather than, they were not, a, I should clarify, I mean, they were multilingual in the sense that China's always had a number of ethnic groups within her yeah. which speak other languages. I mean, there are pockets of a variety of different languages. Oh, okay. But in terms of the Chinese cultural identity, they were like we are, monolingual in the sense that they saw very little reason to learn foreign languages to deal with outsiders. Outsiders could learn Chinese. But I'm not in any way suggesting, no, 
there are many, many ethnic groups who spoke a variety of different languages within China. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Any other question? Okay, I'm holding it too late. We have to be out Nope, nope, that's fine, I appreciate it. Thank you very much.